Preface of Across Asia on a Bicycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcus Pfeiffer, Fairfax, Virginia. Across Asia on a Bicycle by Thomas Allen. Preface Across Asia on a Bicycle the journey of two american students from constantinople to peking by thomas gaskell allen jr and william lewis sackleben new york the century company eighteen ninety four to those at home whose thoughts and wishes were ever with us in our wanderings preface this volume is made up of a series of sketches describing the most interesting part of a bicycle journey around the world our ride across asia we were actuated by no desire to make a record in bicycle travel, although we covered 15,044 miles on the wheel, the longest continuous land journey ever made around the world. The day after we graduated at Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri, we left for New York. Thence we sailed for Liverpool on June 28, 1890. Just three years afterward, lacking 20 days, we rolled into New York on our wheels, having put a girdle around the earth. Our bicycle experience began at Liverpool. After following many of the beaten lines of travel in the British Isles, we arrived in London, where we formed our plans for traveling across Europe, Asia, and America. The most dangerous regions to be traversed in such a journey, we were told, were western China, the desert of Gobi, and central China. Never since the days of Marco Polo had a European traveler succeeded in crossing the Chinese Empire from the west to Peking. Crossing the Channel, we rode through Normandy to Paris, across the lowlands of western France to Bordeaux, eastward over the Lesser Alps to Marseille, and along the Riviera into Italy. After visiting every important city on the peninsula, we left Italy at Brindisi on the last day of 1890 for Corfu in Greece. Thence we traveled to Patras, proceeding along the Corinthian Gulf to Athens, where we passed the winter. We went to Constantinople by vessel in the spring, crossed the Bosporus in April, and began the long journey described in the following pages. When we had finally completed our travels in the Flowery Kingdom, we sailed from Shanghai for Japan. Thence we voyaged to San Francisco, where we arrived on Christmas night, 1892. Three weeks later, we resumed our bicycles and wheeled by way of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas to New York. During all of this journey, we never employed the services of guides or interpreters. We were compelled, therefore, to learn a little of the language of every country through which we passed. Our independence in this regard increased, perhaps, the hardships of the journey, but certainly contributed much toward the object we sought, a close acquaintance with the strange peoples. During our travels, we took more than 2,500 photographs, selections from which are reproduced in the illustrations of this volume. End of preface. Section 1 of Across Asia on a Bicycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina Across Asia on a Bicycle by Thomas Allen Chapter 1 Beyond the Bosporus on a morning early in April, the little steamer conveying us across from Stamboul touched the wharf at Hyder Pasha. Amid the rabble of Greeks, Armenians, Turks, and Italians, we trundled our bicycles across the gangplank, which for us was the threshold of Asia, the beginning of an inland journey of seven thousand miles from the Bosporus to the Pacific. Through the morning fog, which enveloped the shipping in the Golden Horn, the stars and stripes at a single masthead were waving farewell to two American students, fresh from college, who had nerved themselves 
for nearly two years of separation from the comforts of Western civilization. Our guide to the road to Izmid was the little twelve-year-old son of an Armenian doctor, whose guests we had been during our sojourn in Stambul. He trotted for some distance by our side, and then, pressing our hands in both of his, he said with childlike sincerity, I hope God will take care of you. For he was possessed with the thought, popular among Armenians, of pillages and massacres by marauding brigands. The idea of a trip around the world had been conceived by us as a practical finish to a theoretical education, and the bicycle feature was adopted merely as a means to that end. On reaching London, we had formed the plan of penetrating the heart of the Asiatic continent, instead of skirting its more civilized coastline. For a passport and other credentials necessary in journeying through Russia and Central Asia, we had been advised to make application to the Tsar's representative on our arrival at Tehran, as we would enter the Russian dominions from Persia and to that end the Russian minister in London had provided us with a letter of introduction. In London, the secretary of the Chinese legation, a Scotchman, had assisted us in mapping out a possible route across the celestial empire, although he endeavored, from the very start, to dissuade us from our purpose. Application had then been made to the Chinese minister himself for the necessary passport. The reply we received, though courteous, smacked strongly of reproof. Western China, he said, is overrun with lawless bands, and the people themselves are very much averse to foreigners. Your extraordinary mode of locomotion would subject you to annoyance, if not to positive danger at the hands of a people who are naturally curious and superstitious. However, he added, after some reflection, if your minister makes a request for a passport, we will see what can be done. The most I can do will be to ask for you the protection and assistance of the officials only. For the people themselves I cannot answer. If you go into that country, you do so, at your own risk. Minister Lincoln was sitting in his private office when we called the next morning at the American legation. He listened to the recital of our plans, got down the huge atlas from his bookcase, and went over with us the route we proposed to follow. He did not regard the undertaking as feasible, and apprehended that, if he should give his official assistance, he would, in a measure, be responsible for the result, if it should prove unhappy. When assured of the consent of our parents, and of our determination to make the attempt at all hazards, he picked up his pen and began a letter to the Chinese minister, remarking as he finished reading it to us, I would much rather not have written it. The documents received from the Chinese minister, in response to Mr. Lincoln's letter, proved to be indispensable, when, a year and a half later, we left the last outpost of Western civilization, and plunged into the Gobi Desert. When we had paid a final visit to the Persian minister in London, who had asked to see our bicycles and their baggage equipments, he signified his intention of writing in our behalf to friends in Tehran, and to that capital, after cycling through Europe, we were now actually en route. Since the opening of the Trans-Bosporus Railway, the wagon road to Izmid, and even the Angora military highway beyond, have fallen rapidly into disrepair. In April, they were almost impassable for the wheel, so that for the greater part of the way we were obliged to take to the track. 
like the railway skirting the Italian Riviera and the Patras Athens line along the Saronic Gulf, this Transbosporus road, for a great distance, scarps and tunnels the cliffs along the Gulf of Ismid, and sometimes runs so close to the water's edge that the puffing of the Kara Vapor, or land steamer, as the Turks call it, is drowned by the roaring breakers. The country between Scutari and Ismid surpasses in agricultural advantages any part of Asiatic Turkey through which we passed. Its fertile soil and the luxuriant vegetation it supports are, as we afterward learned, in striking contrast with the sterile plateaus and mountains of the interior, many parts of which are as desolate as the deserts of Arabia. In area, Asia Minor equals France, but the water supply of its rivers is only one-third. One of the principal agents in the work of transforming Asia Minor is the railroad, to which the natives have taken with unusual readiness. The locomotive is already competing with the hundred and sixty thousand camels employed in the peninsula caravan trade. At Geva, the last station on the Transbosporus Railway, where we left the track to follow the Angora Highway, the ships of the desert are beginning to transfer their cargoes to the land steamer, instead of continuing on, as in former days, to the Bosporus. The Transbosporus Line, in the year of our visit, was being built and operated by a German company, under the direct patronage of the sultan. We ventured to ask some natives if they thought the sultan had sufficient funds to consummate so gigantic a scheme, and they replied, with the deepest reverence, God has given the padishah much property and power, and certainly he must give him enough money to utilize it. A week cycling from the Bosporus, brought us beyond the Allah Dag mountains, among the barren, variegated hills that skirt the Angora Plateau. We had already passed through Ismid, the ancient Nicomedia and capital of Diocletian, and had left behind us the heavily timbered valley of the Sakaria, upon whose banks the freebooter of the Bithynian hills settled with his four hundred tents, and laid the foundation of the Ottoman Empire. Since leaving Geve, we had been attended by a mounted guard, or Zaptie, who was sometimes forced upon us by the authorities, in their anxiety to carry out the wishes expressed in the letters of the Grand Vizier. On emerging from the door of an inn, we frequently found this unexpected guard waiting with a Winchester rifle swung over his shoulder and a fleet steed standing by his side. Immediately on our appearance, he would swing into the saddle and charge through the assembled rabble. Away we would go at a rapid pace down the streets of the town or village, to the utter amazement of the natives, and the great satisfaction of our vainglorious Zaptie. As long as his horse was fresh, or until we were out of sight of the village, he would urge us on with cries of, Gelchabuk, come on, ride fast. When a bad piece of road or a steep ascent forced us to dismount, he would bring his horse to a walk, roll a cigarette, and draw invidious comparisons between our steeds. His tone, however, changed when we reached a decline or long stretch of reasonably good road. Then he would cut across country to head us off, or shout after us at the top of his voice, Yavash, Yavash, slowly, slowly. On the whole, we found them good-natured and companionable fellows, notwithstanding their interest in bakshish, which we were compelled at last, in self-defense, to fix at one piaster an hour. 
we frequently shared with them our frugal and even scanty meals and in turn they assisted us in our purchases and arrangements for lodgings for their word we found was with the common people an almost unwritten law then too they were of great assistance in crossing streams where the depth would have necessitated the stripping of garments although their fiery little steeds sometimes objected to having an extra rider astride their haunches and a bicycle across their shoulders they seized every opportunity to impress us with the necessity of being accompanied by a government representative in some lonely portion of the road or in the suggestive stillness of an evening twilight our turkish don quixote would sometimes cast mysterious glances around him take his winchester from his shoulder and throwing it across the pommel of his saddle charge ahead to meet the imaginary enemy but we were more harmful than harmed for despite our most vigilant care the bicycles were sometimes the occasion of a stampede or runaway among the caravans and teams along the highway and we frequently assisted in replacing the loads thus upset on such occasions our pretentious cavalier would remain on his horse smoking his cigarette and smiling disdainfully it was in the company of one of these military champions that we emerged on the morning of april twelve upon the plateau of angora on the spring pasture were feeding several flocks of the famous angora goats and the karamanli or fat-tailed sheep tended by the urak shepherds and their half-wild and monstrous collies whose half-savage nature fits them to cope with the jackals which infest the country the shepherds did not check their sudden onslaught upon us until we were pressed to very close quarters and had drawn our revolvers in self-defense these uraks are the nomadic portion of the turkish peasantry they live in caves or rudely constructed huts shifting their habitation at will or upon the exhaustion of the pasturage their costume is most primitive both in style and material the trousers and caps being made of sheepskin and the tunic of plaited wheat straw in contradistinction to the uraks the settled inhabitants of the country are called turks that term however which means rustic or clown is never used by the turks themselves except in derision or disdain they always speak of themselves as osmanli the great length of the angora fleece which sometimes reaches eight inches is due solely to the peculiar climate of the locality the same goats taken elsewhere have not thriven even the angora dogs and cats are remarkable for the extraordinary length of their fleecy covering on nearing angora itself we raced at high speed over the undulating plateau our zaptie on his jaded horse faded away in the dim distance and we saw him no more this was our last guard for many weeks to come as we decided to dispense with an escort that really retarded us but on reaching erzerum the vali refused us permission to enter the district of alashgird without a guard so we were forced to take one we were now on historic ground to our right on the oas a tributary of the sakaria was the little village of istanas where stood the ancient seat of midas the phrygian king and where alexander the great cut with his sword the gordian knot to prove his right to the rulership of the world on the plain over which we were now skimming the great tatar timur fought the memorable battle with bajazet the first 
which resulted in the capture of the Ottoman conqueror. Since the time that the title of Asia applied to the small coast province of Lydia, this country has been the theater for the grandest events in human history. The old mud houses of modern Angora, as we rolled into the city, contrasted strongly with the cyclopean walls of its ancient fortress. After two days in Angora, we diverged from the direct route to Sivas through Yuzgat, so as to visit the city of Caesarea. Through the efforts of the progressive volley at Angora, a macadamized road was in the course of construction to this point, a part of which, to the town of Kersher, was already completed. Although surrounded by unusual fertility and luxuriance for an interior town, the low mud-houses and treeless streets give Kersher that same thirsty and painfully uniform appearance which characterizes every village or city in Asiatic Turkey. The mud buildings of Babylon, and not the marble edifices of Nineveh, have served as models for the Turkish architect. We have seen the Turks, when making the mud-straw bricks used in house-building, scratch dirt for the purpose from between the marble slabs and boulders that lay in profusion over the ground. A few of the government buildings and some of the larger private residences are improved by a coat of whitewash, and now and then the warm spring showers bring out on the mud roofs a relieving verdure that frequently serves as pasture for the family goat. Everything is low and contracted, especially the doorways. When a foreigner bumps his head and demands the reason for such stupid architecture, he is met with that decisive answer, adet, custom, the most powerful of all influences in Turkey and the East. Our entry into Kersher was typical of our reception everywhere. When we were seen approaching, several horsemen came out to get a first look at our strange horses. They challenged us to a race, and set a spanking pace down into the streets of the town. Before we reached the khan, or inn, we were obliged to dismount. Bin, bin, ride, ride, went up in a shout. Nimkin deyil, it is impossible, we explained, in such a jam. And the crowd opened up three or four feet ahead of us. Bin bokale, ride so that we can see, they shouted again. And some of them rushed up to hold our steeds for us to mount. With the greatest difficulty, we impressed upon our persistent assistance that they could not help us. By the time we reached the Khan, the crowd had become almost a mob, pushing and tumbling over one another, and yelling to everyone in sight that the devil's carts have come. The innkeeper came out, and we had to assure him that the mob was actuated only by curiosity. As soon as the bicycles were over the threshold, the doors were bolted and braced. The crowds swarmed to the windows. While the kanji prepared coffee, we sat down to watch the amusing by-play and repartee going on around us. Those who, by virtue of their friendship with the kanji, were admitted to the room with us, began a tirade against the boyish curiosity of their less fortunate brethren on the outside. Their own curiosity assumed tangible shape. Our clothing, and even our hair and faces, were critically examined. When we attempted to jot down the day's events in our notebooks, they crowded closer than ever. Our fountain pen was an additional puzzle to them. It was passed around, and explained, and commented on at length. Our camera was a mysterious black box. Some said it was a telescope about which they had only a vague idea. 
others that it was a box containing our money but our map of asiatic turkey was to them the most curious thing of all they spread it on the floor and hovered over it while we pointed to the towns and cities how could we tell where the places were until we had been there how did we even know their names it was wonderful wonderful we traced for them our own journey where we had been and where we were going and then endeavored to show them how by starting from our homes and continuing always in an easterly direction we could at last reach our starting point from the west the more intelligent of them grasped the idea around the world they repeated again and again with a mystified expression relief came at last in the person of a messenger from osman beg the inspector general of agriculture of the angora vilayet bearing an invitation to supper he stated that he had already heard of our undertaking through the constantinople press and desired to make our acquaintance his note which was written in french showed him to be a man of european education and on shaking hands with him a half hour later we found him to be a man of european origin an albanian greek and a cousin of the valley at angora he said a report had gone out that two devils were passing through the country the dinner was one of those incongruous turkish mixtures of sweet and sour which was by no means relieved by the harrowing turkish music which our host ground out from an antiquated hand organ although it was late when we returned to the khan we found everybody still up the room in which we were to sleep there was only one room was filled with a crowd of loiterers and tobacco smoke some were playing games similar to our chess and backgammon while others were looking on and smoking the gurgling nargyle or water pipe the bicycles had been put away under lock and key and the crowd gradually dispersed we lay down in our clothes and tried to lose consciousness but the turkish supper the tobacco smoke and the noise of the quarrelling gamesters put sleep out of the question at midnight the sudden boom of a cannon reminded us that we were in the midst of the turkish ramadan the sound of tramping feet the beating of a bass drum and the whining tones of a turkish bagpipe came over the midnight air nearer it came and louder grew the sound till it reached the inn door where it remained for some time the fast of ramadan commemorates the revelation of the koran to the prophet mohammed it lasts through the four phases of the moon from daylight or as the koran reads from the time you can distinguish a white thread from a black one no good mussulman will eat drink or smoke at midnight the mosques are illuminated and bands of music go about the streets all night making a tremendous uproar one cannon is fired at dusk to announce the time to break the fast by eating supper another at midnight to arouse the people for the preparation of breakfast and still another at daylight as a signal for resuming the fast this of course is very hard on the poor man who has to work during the day as a precaution against oversleeping a watchman goes about just before daybreak and makes a rousing clatter at the gate of every mussulman's house to warn him that if he wants anything to eat he must get it instanter our roommates evidently intended to make an all-night of it for they forthwith commenced the preparation of their morning meal how it was dispatched we do not know for we fell asleep and were only awakened by the muezzin on a neighboring minaret calling to morning prayer 
our morning ablutions were usually made a la turk by having water poured upon the hands from a spouted vessel cleanliness is with the turk perhaps more than ourselves the next thing to godliness but his ideas are based upon a very different theory although he uses no soap for washing either his person or his clothes yet he considers himself much cleaner than the giar for the reason that he uses running water exclusively never allowing the same particles to touch him the second time a turk believes that all water is purified after running six feet as a test of his faith we have often seen him lading up drinking water from a stream where the women were washing clothes just a few yards above as all cooking and eating had stopped at the sound of the morning cannon we found great difficulty in gathering together even a cold breakfast of ekmek yurt and raisins ekmek is a cooked bran flour paste which has the thinness consistency and almost the taste of blotting paper this is the turkish peasant's staff of life he carries it with him everywhere so did we as it was made in huge circular sheets we would often punch a hole in the middle and slip it up over our arms this we found the handiest and most serviceable mode of transportation being handy to eat without removing our hands from the handlebars and also answering the purpose of sails in case of a favoring wind yurt another almost universal food is milk curdled with rennet this as well as all foods that are not liquid they scoop up with a roll of ekmek a part of the scoop being taken with every mouthful raisins here as well as in many other parts of the country are very cheap we paid two piasters about nine cents for an osh two and a half pounds but we soon made the discovery that a turkish osh contained a great many stones which of course was purely accidental eggs also we found exceedingly cheap on one occasion twenty-five were set before us in response to our call for eggs to the value of one piaster four and a half cents in asiatic turkey we had some extraordinary dishes served to us including daintily prepared leeches but the worst mixture perhaps was the bairam soup which contains over a dozen ingredients including peas prunes walnuts cherries dates white and black beans apricots cracked wheat raisins etc all mixed in cold water bairam is the period of feasting after the ramadan fast on preparing to leave kirshir after our frugal breakfast we found that turkish curiosity had extended even to the contents of our baggage which fitted in the frames of the machines there was nothing missing however and we did not lose so much as a button during our sojourn among them thieving is not one of their faults but they take much latitude in helping themselves many a time an innkeeper would help us out by disposing of one-third of a chicken that we had paid him a high price to prepare when we were ready to start the chief of police cleared a riding space through the streets which for an hour had been filled with people as we passed among them they shouted uruglar olson may good fortune attend you inshallah if it please god we replied and waved our helmets in acknowledgment at the village of Topakle, on the following night, our reception was not so innocent and good-natured. It was already dusk when we reached the outskirts of the village, where we were at once spied by a young man who was driving in the lowing herd. The alarm was given, 
and the people swarmed like so many rats from a corn bin. We could see from their costume and features that they were not pure-blooded Turks. We asked if we could get food and lodging, to which they replied, Evet, Evet, yes, yes. But when we asked them where, they simply pointed ahead and shouted, Bin, Bin. We did not bin this time, because it was too dark, and the streets were bad. We walked, or rather were pushed along, by the impatient rabble, and almost deafened by their shouts of bin, bin. At the end of the village we repeated our question of where. Again they pointed ahead, and shouted bin. Finally an old man led us to what seemed to be a private residence, where we had to drag our bicycles up a dark, narrow stairway to the second story. The crowd soon filled the room to suffocation, and were not disposed to heed our request to be left alone. One stalwart youth showed such a spirit of opposition that we were obliged to eject him upon a crowded stairway, causing the mob to go down like a row of tenpins. Then the owner of the house came in, and in an agitated manner declared he could not allow us to remain in his house overnight. Our reappearance caused a jeering shout to go up from the crowd, but no violence was attempted beyond the catching hold of the rear wheel when our backs were turned, and the throwing of clods of earth. They followed us en masse to the edge of the village, and there stopped short, to watch us till we disappeared in the darkness. The nights at this high altitude were chilly. We had no blankets, and not enough clothing to warrant a camp among the rocks. There was not a twig on the whole plateau with which to build a fire. We were alone, however, and that was rest in itself. After walking an hour, perhaps, we saw a light gleaming from a group of mud huts a short distance off the road. From the numerous flocks around it, we took it to be a shepherd's village. Everything was quiet except the restless sheep, whose silky fleece glistened in the light of the rising moon. Supper was not yet over, for we caught a whiff of its savory odor. Leaving our wheels outside, we entered the first door we came to, and following along a narrow passageway, emerged into a room where four rather rough-looking shepherds were ladling the soup from a huge bowl in their midst. Before they were aware of our presence, we uttered the usual salutation, Sabala Kair Olson. This startled some little boys who were playing in the corner who yelled and ran into the haremluk, or women's apartment. This brought to the door the female occupants, who also uttered a shriek and sunk back as if in a swoon. It was evident that the visits of Giars to this place had been few and far between. The shepherds returned our salutation with some hesitation, while their ladles dropped into the soup and their gaze became fixed on our huge helmets, our dogskin topcoats, and abbreviated nether garments. The women by this time had sufficiently recovered from their nervous shock to give scope to their usual curiosity through the cracks in the partition. Confidence now being inspired by our own composure, we were invited to sit down and participate in the evening meal. Although it was only a gruel of sour milk and rice, we managed to make a meal off it. Meantime, the wheels had been discovered by some passing neighbor. The news was spread throughout the village, and soon an excited throng came in with our bicycles, borne upon the shoulders of two powerful Turks. Again, we were besieged with entreaties to ride, 
and hoping that this would gain for us a comfortable night's rest, we yielded, and amid peals of laughter from a crowd of Turkish peasants, gave an exhibition in the moonlight. Our only reward, when we returned to our quarters, was two greasy pillows and a filthy carpet for a coverlet, but the much-needed rest we did not secure, for the suspicions aroused by the first glance at our bed-cover proved to be well-grounded. End of section one. Section two of Across Asia on a Bicycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Recording by Louis James Mordier. Across Asia on a Bicycle by Thomas Allen. Chapter 2 Across the Bosphorus. Part 2. About noon on April the 20th, our road turned abruptly into the broad caravan trail that runs between Smyrna and Caesarea, about ten miles west of the latter city. A long caravan of camels was moving majestically up the road, headed by a little donkey, which the Devadigi camel driver was riding with his feet dangling almost to the ground. That proverbially stubborn creature moved not a muscle until we came alongside, when all at once he gave one of his characteristic side lurches and precipitated the rider to the ground. The first camel, with a protesting grunt, began to sidle off, and a broadside movement continued down the line till the whole caravan stood at an angle of about forty-five degrees to the road. The camel of Asia Minor does not share that antipathy for the equine species which is so general among their Asiatic cousins, but steel horses were more than even they could endure. A sudden turn in the road brought us in sight of old Arjish Dar, which towers 13,000 feet above the city of Kazaria, but whose head and shoulders were covered with snow. Native tradition tells us that against this lofty summit the Ark of Noah struck in the rising flood, but for this reason Noah cursed it, and prayed that it might ever be covered with snow. It was in connection with this very mountain that we first conceived the idea of making the ascent of Ararat. Here and there, on some of the most prominent peaks, we could distinguish little mounds of earth, the ruined watchtowers of the prehistoric Hittites. Caesarea, ancient Caesarea, is filled with the ruins and the monuments of the 14th century Sedgwick. Our heads and other relics are every day unearthed there to serve as toys for the street urchins. Since the development of steam communication around the coast, it is no longer the caravan centre that it used to be, but even now its charshi, or enclosed bazaars, are among the finest in Turkey, being far superior in appearance to those of Constantinople. These charshi are nothing more than narrow streets, enclosed by brick arches, and lined on either side with booths. It was through one of these that our only route to the Khan lay, and yet we felt that in such contracted quarters and in such an excited mob as had gathered around us, disaster was sure to follow. Our only salvation was to keep ahead of the jam and get through as soon as possible. We started on the spurt, and the race began. The unsuspecting merchants and their customers were suddenly distracted from their thoughts of gain as we whirled by the crowd close behind, sweeping everything before it, the falling of barrels and boxes, the rattling of tin cans, the crashing of crockery, the howling of the vagrant dogs that we trampled underfoot only added to the general tumult. Through the courtesy of Mr. Pete of the American Bible House at Constantinople, we were provided with letters of introduction to the missionaries of Caesarea, as well as elsewhere along our route for Asiatic Turkey and upon them we also had drafts to the amount of our deposit made at the Bible House before starting. Besides, 
we owed much to the hospitality and kindness of these people. The most striking feature of the missionary work of Kizaria is the education of the Armenian women, whose social position seems to be even more degraded than that of their Turkish sisters. With the native Armenians, as with the Turks, fleshiness adds much to the price of a wife. The wife of a missionary is to them an object both of wonderment and contempt. As she walks along the street, they will whisper to one another, There goes a woman who knows all her husband's business, and who can manage just as well as himself. This will generally be followed in an undertone by the expression Madana Satana, which means in common parlance, a female devil. At first it was a struggle to overcome this ignorant prejudice, and to get girls to come to the school free of charge. Now it is hard to find room for them, even when they are asked to pay for their tuition. The costume of the Armenian woman is generally of some bright-coloured cloth, prettily trimmed, her coiffure always elaborate, sometimes includes a string of gold coins encircling the head, or strung down the flat. A silver belt encloses the waist, and a necklace of coins calls attention to her pretty neck. When washing clothes by the stream, they frequently show a gold ring encircling an ankle. In the simplicity of their costumes, as well as in the fact that they do not expose the face, the Turkish women stand in strong contrast to the Armenian. Baggy trousers, a la bluma, a loose robe skirt opening at the sides, and a voluminous shawl-like girdle around the waist and body constitute the main features of the Turkish indoor costume. On the street, a shroud-like robe called yashmak, usually white, but sometimes crimson, purple or black, covers them from head to foot. When we would meet a bevy of these creatures on the road in the dusk of evening, their white fluttering garments would give them the appearance of winged celestials. The Turkish women are generally timorous of men, and especially so of foreigners. Those of the rural districts, however, are not so shy as their city cousins. We frequently met them at working groups about the villages or in the open fields and would sometimes ask for a drink of water. If they were a party of maidens, as would often the case, they would draw back and hide behind one another. We would offer one of them a ride on our very nice horses. This would cause a general giggle among her companions, and a drawing of the yashmak closer about the neck and face. The road scenes in the interior provinces are but little varied. One of the most characteristic features of the Anatolian landscape are the storks, which come in flocks of thousands from their winter quarters in Egypt, and build summer nests unmolested on the village housetops. These, like the crows, magpies, and swallows, prove valuable allies to their husbands in their war against the locusts. A still more serviceable friend in this direction is the smarma, a pink thrush with black wings. Besides the various caravan trains of camels, donkeys, horses, and mules, the road is frequently dotted with ox carts, run on solid wooden wheels without tyres, and drawn by that peculiar bovine species, the buffalo. With their distended necks, elevated snouts, and hog-like bristles, these animals present an ugly appearance, especially when wallowing in mud puddles. Now and then, in the villages, we pass by a primitive flour mill moved by a small stream playing upon a horizontal wheel beneath the floor, or more primitive still, by a blindfolded donkey plodding ceaselessly around in the circular path. In the streets, we frequently encountered boys and old men, gathering manure for their winter fuel, and now and then a cripple or invalid would accost us as Hakim, doctor, for the medical work of the missionaries has given these simple-minded folk the impression that all foreigners are physicians. Coming up and extending a hand for us to feel the pulse, they would ask us to do something for the disease which we could see was rapidly carrying them to the grave. Our first view of Sivas was obtained from the top of Mount Yildiz, on which still stands the ruined castle of Mithridates, the Pontine monarch, whom Lucullus many times defeated but never conquered. From this point we made a very rapid descent, crossed the Kizil Irmak for the third time by an old ruined bridge, and half an hour later saw the stars and stripes flying above the U.S. consulate. In the society of our representative, Mr. Henry M. Jewett, we were destined to spend several weeks. 
For a day or two after our arrival, one of us was taken with a slight attack of typhoid fever, supposed to have been contracted by drinking from the roadside streams. No better place could have been chosen for such a mishap, for recovery was speedy in such comfortable quarters under the care of the missionary lady. The comparative size and prosperity of Siva in the midst of rather barren surroundings are explained by the fact that it lies at the converging point of the chief caravan routes between the Euxine, Euphrates, and Mediterranean. Besides being the capital of Rumili, the former sacred province of Cappadocia, it is a place of residence for a French and American consular representative and an agent of the Russian government for the collection of the war indemnity. Stipulated in the Treaty of 78, the dignity of office is here upheld with something of the pomp and splendor of the East, even by the representative of democratic America. In our tours of Mr. Jewett, we were escorted at the head by a Circassian Kavat, Turkish police, clothed in a long black coat with a huge dagger dangling from a belt of cartridges. Another native Kavat with a broadsword dragging at his side, usually brought up the rear. At night, he was the one to carry the huge lantern, which, according to the number of candles, is the insignia of rank. I must give the Turks what they want, said the consul with a twinkle in his eye. Form and red tape. I would not be a consul in their eyes if I didn't. To illustrate the formality of Turkish etiquette, he told this story. A Turk was once engaged in saving furniture from his burning home, when he noticed that a bystander was rolling a cigarette. He immediately stopped in his hurry, struck a match, and offered a light. The most flagrant example of Turkish formality that came to our notice was the following address on an official document to the Sultan, with the Arbiter, the Absolute, the solemn body of the universe, the father of all sovereigns of the earth, His Excellency the Eagle Monarch, the cause of the never-changing order of things, the source of all honour, the son of the Sultan of Sultan, under whose feet we are dust whose awful shadow protects us. Abdul Hamid II, son of Abdul Medjid, whose residence is in paradise, our glorious Lord, to whose sacred body be given health and strength from endless days, whom Allah keeps in his palace, and on his throne with joy and glory forever. Amen. This is not the flattery of a cringing subordinate, for the same spirit is revealed in the address by the Sultan himself to his Grand Vizier. Most honoured vizier, maintainer of the good order of the world, director of public affairs with wisdom and judgment, accomplisher of the important transactions of mankind with intelligence and good sense, consolidator of the edifice of empire and of glory, endowed by the most high of abundant gifts, a monshir at this time of my gate of felicity, my vizier Mehmed Pasha, may God be pleased to preserve him long in exalted dignity. The Turks cannot be called lazy, yet they like to take their time. Patience, they say, belongs to God, hurry to the devil. Nowhere is this so well illustrated as in the manner of shopping in Turkey. This was brought particularly to our notice when we visited the Sivas bazaars to examine some inlaid silverware, for which the place is celebrated. The customer stands in the street, inspecting the articles on exhibition. The merchant sits on his heels on the booth floor. If the customer is of some position in life, he climbs up and sits down on a level with the merchant. If he is a foreigner, the merchant is quite deferential. A merchant is not a merchant at all, but a host entertaining a guest. Coffee is served, then a cigarette rolled up and handed to the guest, while the various social and other local topics are freely discussed. After coffee and smoking, the question of purchase is gradually approached, not abruptly, as that would involve a loss of dignity, but circumspectly, as if the buying of anything were a mere afterthought. Maybe, after half an hour, the customer has indicated what he wants, and after discussing the quality of the goods, the customer asks the price in an off-hand way, as though he were not particularly interested. The merchant replies, Oh, whatever your highness pleases, or... I shall be proud if your highness will do me the honour to accept it as a gift. This means nothing whatever, and is merely the introduction to the haggling which is sure to follow. The seller, with silken manners and brazen countenance, will always name a price four times as large as it should be. Then the real business begins. The buyer offers one half or one fourth of what he finally expects to pay. 
and a war of words, in a blustering tone, leads up to the close of this everyday farce. The superstition of the Turks is nowhere so apparent as in their fear of the evil eye. Jugs placed around the edge of the roof, or an old shoe filled with garlic and blue beets, blue glass balls or rings, are a sure guard against this illusion. Whenever a pretty child is playing upon the street, the passers-by will say, Oh, what an ugly child, the fear of inciting the evil spirit against its beauty. The peasant classes in Turkey are of course the most superstitious, because they are the most ignorant. They have no education whatever, and can neither read nor write. Istanbul is the only great city of which they know. Paris is a term signifying the whole outside world. An American missionary was once asked, In what part of Paris is America? Yet it can be said that they are generally honest and always patient. They earn from about six to eight cents a day. This will furnish them with ekmek and pilaf, and that is all they expect. They eat meat only on feast day, and then only mutton. The tax gatherer is their only grievance. They look upon him as a necessary evil. They have no idea of being ground down under the oppressor's iron heel. Yet they are happy because they are contented and have no envy. The poorer, the more ignorant a Turk is, the better he seems to be. As he gets money and power and becomes contaminated by Western civilization, he deteriorates. A resident of twenty years' experience said, In the lowest classes I have sometimes found truth, honesty and gratitude. In the middle classes seldom, in the highest, never. The corruptibility of the Turkish official is almost proverbial, but such is to be expected in a land where the public treasury is regarded as a sea, and who does not drink of it as a pig? Peculation and malversation are fully expected in a public official. The unnecessary evils are debt. Custom has made them so. Offices are sold to the highest bidder. The Turkish official is one of the politest and most agreeable of men. He is profuse in his compliments, but he has no conscience as to bribes and little regard for virtue as its own reward. We are glad to be able to record a brilliant, though perhaps theoretical, exception to this general rule. At Kok Hisar, on our way from Sivath to Kara Hisar, a delay was caused by a rather serious break in one of our bicycles. In the interval, we were in the invited guest of a district cardi, a venerable looking and genial old gentleman, whose acquaintance we had made in an official visit on the previous day, as he was then the acting Kaimakam, mayor. His house was situated in a neighbouring valley, in the shadow of a towering bluff. We were ushered into the salam room, or guest apartment, in company with an Armenian friend, who had been educated as a doctor in America, and who had consented to act as interpreter for the occasion. The Qadi entered with a smile on his countenance, and made the usual picturesque form of salutation by describing the figure free with his right hand and floor to his forehead. Perhaps it was because he wanted to be polite that he said he had enjoyed our company on the previous day, and had determined, if possible, to have a more extended conversation. With the usual coffee and cigarettes, the Cardi became informal and chatty. He was evidently a firm believer in predestination, as he remarked that God had foreordained our trip to that country. Even the food we were to eat, and the invention of the extraordinary cart on which we were to ride, the idea of such a journey in such a peculiar way was not to be accredited to the ingenuity of man. There was a purpose in it all. When we ventured to thank him for his hospitality toward two strangers and even foreigners, he said that this world occupied so small a space in God's dominion that we could well afford to be brothers one to another, in spite of our individual beliefs and opinions. We may have different religious beliefs, said he, but we all belong to the same great father of humanity. Just as children of different complexions, dispositions, and intellects may belong to one common parent, we should exercise reason always and have charity for other people's opinions. From charity, the conversation naturally turns to justice. We were much interested in the opinion on this subject as that of a Turkish judge and a rather high official. Justice, said he, should be administered by the humblest person. Though a king should be the offending party, all alike must yield to the sacred law of justice. We must account to God for our acts and not to men.
The regular route from Sebastopol to Zerum passes through Azinjan. From this, however, we diverged at Zala in order to visit the city of Karahisa and the neighbouring Lijisi mines, which had been pioneered by the Genoese explorers and were now being worked by a party of Englishmen. This divergence onto unbeaten paths was made at a very inopportune season, for the rainy spell set in, which lasted with scarcely any intermission for over a fortnight. At the base of Kosadar, which stands upon the watershed between the two largest rivers of Asia Minor, the Kazil Irmak and the Yeshil Irmak, our road was blocked by a mountain freshet, which at its height washed everything before it. We spent a day and night on its bank, in a primitive flour mill, which was so far removed from domestic life that we had to send three miles up in the mountains to get something to eat. The Yeshil Irmak, which we crossed just before reaching Karahisar, was above our shoulders as we waded through, holding our bicycles and baggage over our heads. While a swift current rolled the small boulders against us and almost knocked us off our feet, there were no bridges in this part of the country. With horses and wagons, the rivers were usually fordable. And what more would you want? With the Turk, as with all Asiatics, it is not a question of what is better, but what we'll do. Long before we reached the stream, the inhabitants of a certain town or village would gather round and with troubled countenance to say, Christian gentlemen, there is no bridge, pointing to the river beyond and graphically describing that it was above our horses' heads. That would settle it, they thought. It never occurred to them that a Christian gentleman could take off his clothes and wave. Sometimes, as we walked along the mud, the wheels of our bicycle become so clogged that we could not even push them before us. In such a case, we would take the nearest shelter, whatever it might be. The night before reaching Karahisar, we entered an abandoned stable from which everything had fled, except the fleas. Another night was spent in the pine forests, just on the border between Asia Minor and Armenia, which was said to be the haunts of the border robbers. Our surroundings could not be relieved by a fire for fear of retracting their attention. When at last we reached the Trebizond Azerum Highway at Baibut, the contrast was so great that the scaling of Kop Dar on its comparatively smooth surface was a mere breakfast spell. From here we looked down for the first time into the valley of the historic Euphrates, and a few hours later we were skimming over its bottom lands towards the embattled heights of Azerum. As we neared the city, some Turkish peasants in the fields caught sight of us and shouted to their companions, Russians! Russians! There they are, two of them! This was not the first time we had been taken for the subjects of the Tsar. The whole country seemed to be in dread of them. Azerum is the capital of that district, which Russia will no doubt demand if the stipulated war indemnity is not paid. The entrance into the city was made to twist and turn among the ramparts so as to avoid a rush in case of an attack. But this was no proof against the surprise in the case of the noiseless wheel. In we dashed with a roaring wind past the affrighted guards and were fifty yards away before they could collect their scattered senses. Then suddenly it dawned upon them that we were human beings and foreigners besides, perhaps even the dreaded Russian spies. They took after us at full speed, but it was too late. Before they reached us, we were in the house of the Commandant Pasha, the military governor, to whom we had a letter of introduction from our consul at Siva. That like gentleman we found extremely good-natured. He laughed heartily at our escapade with the guards. Nothing would do, but we must visit the Vali, the civil governor, who was also a Pasha of considerable reputation in Italy. We had intended, but not so soon, to pay an official visit to the Vali, to present our letter from the Grand Vizier and asked his permission to proceed to Bayezid, whence we had planned to attempt the ascent of Mount Ararat, an experience which will be described in the next chapter. A few days before we heard, a similar application had been made by an English traveller from Baghdad, but owing to certain suspicions, the permission was refused. It was with no little concern, therefore, that we approached the Vali's private office, in company with his French interpreter, Circumstances augured ill at the very start. The Vali was evidently in a bad humour, for we overheard him storming in a high key at someone in the room with him. As he passed under the heavily matted curtain, 
the two attendants who were holding him up cast a rather horrified glance at our dusty shoes in unconventional costume. The Vali was sitting in a large armchair in front of a very small desk, placed at the far end of a vacant-looking room. After the usual salams, he motioned to a seat on the divan, and proceeded at once to examine our credentials while we sipped at our coffees and whiffed off the small cigarettes which were immediately sent. This furnished the Vali an opportunity to regain his usual composure. He was evidently an autocrat of the severest type. If we pleased him, it would be all right. If we did not, it would be all wrong. We showed him everything we had, from our Chinese passport to the little photographic camera, and related some of the most amusing incidents of our journey through his country. From the numerous questions he asked, we got certain of his genuine interest and were more than pleased to see an occasional broad smile on his countenance. Well, said he, as we rose to take leave, your passport will be ready any time after tomorrow. In the meantime, I should be pleased to have your horses quartered and fed at government expense. This is a big joke for a Turk, and assured us of his goodwill. A bicycle exhibition, which the Vali had requested, was given the morning of our departure for Bayazi, on a level stretch of road just outside the city. Several missionaries and members of the consulates had gone out in carriages and formed a little group by themselves. We rode up with the stars and stripes and starring present, fluttering side by side from the handlebar. It was always our custom, especially on diplomatic occasions, to have a little flag of the country associated with that of our own. The little arrangement evoked a smile from the Bali, who, when the exhibition was finished, stepped forward and said, I am satisfied, I am pleased. His richly caparisoned white charger was now brought up. Leaping into the saddle, he waved us goodbye and moved away with his suite towards the city. We ourselves remained for a few moments to bid goodbye to our hospitable friends and then once more continued our journey towards the east. End of section two. Section three. Across Asia on a Bicycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Price at voiceoverthefence.com. Across Asia on a Bicycle by Thomas Allen. Chapter 2. According to tradition, Mount Ararat is the scene of two of the most important events in the history of the human race. In the sacred land of Eden, which Armenian legend places at its base, the first of human life was born and on its solitary peak the last of human life was saved from an all-destroying flood. The remarkable geographical position of this mountain seems to justify the Armenian view that it is the center of the world. It is on the longest line drawn through the Old World from the Cape of Good Hope to Bering Strait. It is also on the line of the great deserts and inland seas stretching from Gibraltar to Lake Baikal in Siberia, a line of continuous depressions. It is equidistant from the Black and Caspian Seas and the Mesopotamian Plain, which three depressions are now watered by three distinct river systems emanating from Ararat's immediate vicinity. No other region has seen or heard so much of the story of mankind. In its grim presence, empires have come and gone. Cities have risen and fallen. Human life has soared up on the wings of hope and dashed against the rocks of despair to the eye of Ararat presents a gently inclined slope of sand and ashes rising into a belt of green, another zone of black volcanic rocks streaked with snowbeds, and then a glittering crest of silver. From the burning desert at its base to the icy pinnacle above, it rises through a vertical distance of 13,000 feet. There are but few peaks in the world that rise so high, 17,250 feet above sea level. From so low a plain, 2,000 feet on the Russian, and 4,000 feet on the Turkish side, and which, therefore, present so grand a spectacle. Unlike many of the world's mountains, it stands alone. Little Ararat, 12,840 feet above sea level, and the other still smaller heights that dot the plain, only serve as a standard by which to measure Ararat's immensity and grandeur. Little Ararat is the meeting point, or cornerstone, of three great empires. On its conical peak converge the dominions of the Tsar, the Sultan, and the Shah. The Russian border line runs from Little Ararat along the high ridge which separates it from Great Ararat, through the peak of the latter, 
and onward a short distance to the northwest then turns sharply to the west on the sardar bulak pass between great and little ararat is stationed a handful of russian cossacks to remind lawless tribes of the guardianship of the white sultan the two ararats together form an elliptical mass about twenty-five miles in length running northwest and southeast and about half that in width out of this massive base rise the two ararat peaks their bases being contiguous up to eight thousand eight hundred feet and their tops about seven miles apart little ararat is an almost perfect truncated cone while great ararat is more of a broad-shouldered dome supported by strong rough-ribbed buttresses the isolated position of ararat its structure of igneous rocks the presence of small craters and immense volcanic fissures on the slopes and the scoriae and ashes on the surface on the surrounding plain establish beyond a doubt its volcanic origin but according to the upheaval theory of the eminent geologist hermann abich who was among the few to make the ascent of the mountain there never was a great central crater in either great or little ararat certain it is that no craters or signs of craters now exist on the summit of either mountain but mr james bryce who made the last ascent in eighteen seventy six seems to think that there is no sufficient reason why craters could not have previously existed and been filled up by their own eruptions there is no record of any eruption in historical times the only thing approaching it was the earthquake which shook the mountain in eighteen forty accompanied by subterranean rumblings and destructive blasts of wind the tatar village of arguri and a kurdish encampment on the northeast slope were entirely destroyed by the precipitated rocks not a man was left to tell the story mr bryce and others have spoken of the astonishing height of the snow line on mount ararat which is placed at fourteen thousand feet while in the alps it is only about nine thousand feet and in the caucasus on an average eleven thousand feet although they lie in a very little higher latitude they assign as a reason for this the exceptionally dry region in which ararat is situated mr bryce ascended the mountain on september twelfth when the snow line was at its very highest the first large snow bed he encountered being at twelve thousand feet our own ascent being made as early as july four in fact the earliest ever recorded we found some snow as low as eight thousand feet and large beds at ten thousand five hundred feet the top of little ararat was still at the time streaked with snow but not covered with so many extensive snow beds one would naturally expect to find copious brooks and streams flowing down the mountain into the plain but owing to the porous and dry nature of the soil the water is entirely lost before reaching the base of the mountain even as early as july we saw no stream below six thousand feet and even above this height the mountain freshets frequently flowed far beneath the surface under the loosely packed rocks bidding defiance to our efforts to reach them notwithstanding the scarcity of snow freshets there is a middle zone on mount ararat extending from about five thousand feet to nine thousand feet elevation which is covered with good pasturage kept green by heavy dews and frequent showers the hot air begins to rise from the desert plain as the morning sun peeps over the horizon and continues through the day this warm current striking against the snow-covered summit is condensed into clouds and moisture in consequence the top of ararat is usually during the summer months at least obscured by clouds from some time after dawn until sunset on the last day of our ascent however we were particularly fortunate in having a clear summit until one fifteen in the afternoon among the crags of the upper slope are found only a few specimens of the wild goat and sheep and lower down the fox wolf and lynx the bird and insect life is very scanty but lizards and scorpions especially on the lowest slopes are abundant the rich pasturage of ararat's middle zone attracts pastoral kurdish tribes these nomadic shepherds a few tatars at new Arguri, and a camp of russian cossacks at the well of sardabulak are the only human beings to disturb the quiet solitude of this grandest of nature's sanctuaries the first recorded ascent of mount ararat was in eighteen twenty nine by dr frederick parrott a russo-german professor in the university of dorpat he reached the summit with a party of three armenians and two russian soldiers after two unsuccessful attempts his ascent however was doubted not only by the people in the neighborhood but by many men of science and position in the russian empire notwithstanding his clear account which has been confirmed by subsequent observers and in spite of the testimony of the two russian soldiers who had gone with him two of the armenians who reached the summit with him declared that they had gone to a great height but at the point where they had left off had seen much higher tops rising around them this thereupon became the opinion of the whole country after antonomov in eighteen thirty four herabich the geologist made his valuable ascent in eighteen forty five he reached the eastern summit which is only a few feet lower than the western and only a few minutes walk from it 
but was obliged to return at once on account of the threatening weather. When he produced his companions at witnesses before the authorities at Erevan, they turned against him, and solemnly swore that at the point which they had reached a higher peak stood between them and the western horizon. This strengthened the Armenian belief in the inaccessibility of Ararat, which was not dissipated when the Russian military engineer, General Chodsko, and an English party made the ascent in 1856. Nor were their prejudiced minds convinced by the ascent of Mr. Bryce twenty years later, in 1876. Two days after his ascent, that gentleman paid a visit to the Armenian monastery at Ekmiedzin and was presented to the Archimandrite as the Englishman who had just ascended the top of Massis. No, said the ecclesiastical dignitary, that cannot be. No one has ever been there. It is impossible. Mr. Bryce himself says, I am persuaded that there is not a person living within sight of Ararat, unless it be exceptionally educated Russian official at Erevan, who believes that any human foot, since Father Noah's, has trodden that sacred summit. So much stronger is faith than sight, or rather so much stronger is prejudice than evidence. We had expected on our arrival in Bayazid to find in waiting for us a Mr. Richardson, an American missionary from Erzurum. Two years later, on our arrival home, we received a letter explaining that on his way from Vaughan he had been captured by Kurdish brigands and held a prisoner until released through the intervention of the British consul at Erzurum. It was some such fate as this that was predicted for us, should we ever attempt the ascent of Mount Ararat through the lawless Kurdish tribes upon its slopes. Our first duty, therefore, was to see the Mutasarif of Bayezid, to whom we bore a letter from the Grand Vizier of Turkey, in order to ascertain what protection and assistance he would be willing to give us. We found him with a Circassian, who belonged to the Russian camp at Sardabulak, on the Ararat Pass, and who had accompanied General Chodsko on his ascent of the mountain in 1856. Both he and the Mutisarif thought an ascent so early in the year was impossible, that we ought not to think of such a thing until two months later. It was now six weeks earlier than the time of General Chotsko's ascent, then the earliest on record. They both strongly recommended the northwestern slope as being more gradual. This is the one that Parrot ascended in 1829, and where Abich was repulsed on his third attempt. Though entirely inexperienced in mountain climbing, we ourselves thought that the southeast slope, the one taken by General Chodsko, the English party, and Mr. Bryce, was far more feasible for a small party. One thing, however, the Mutisarif was determined upon, we must not approach the mountain without an escort of Turkish zaptias, as an emblem of government protection. Besides, he would send for the chief of the Ararat Kurds and endeavor to arrange with him for our safety and guidance up the mountain. As we emerged into the streets, an Armenian professor gravely shook his head. Ah, said he, you will never do it. Then, dropping his voice, he told us that those other ascents were all fictitious, that the summit of Massis had never yet been reached except by Noah, and that we were about to attempt what was an utter impossibility. In Bayazid, we could not procure even proper wood for alpenstocks. Willow branches, two inches thick, very dry and brittle, were the best we could obtain. Light as this wood is, the alpenstocks weighed at least seven pounds apiece when the iron hooks and points were riveted on at the ends by the native blacksmith for whom we cut paper patterns of the exact size for everything we wanted. We next had large nails driven into the soles of our shoes by a local shoemaker, who made them for us by hand out of an old English file, and who wanted to pull them all out again because we would not pay him the exorbitant price he demanded. In buying provisions for the expedition, we spent three hours among the half-dilapidated bazaars of the town, which have never been repaired since the disastrous Russian bombardment. The most difficult task, perhaps, in our work of preparation was to strike a bargain with an Armenian muleteer to carry our food and baggage up the mountain on his two little donkeys. Evening came, and no word from either the Mutasarif or the Kurdish chief. Although we were extremely anxious to set off on the expedition before bad weather set in, we must not be in a hurry, for the military governor of Karakalisa was now the guest of the Mutasarif, and it would be an interference with his social duties to try to see him until after his guest had departed. On the morrow we were sitting in our small dingy room after dinner, when a cavalcade hastened up to our inn, and a few minutes later we were surprised to hear ourselves addressed in our native tongue. Before us stood a dark-complexioned young man, and at his side a small, wiry old gentleman, who proved to be a native Austrian Tyrolese, who followed the profession of an artist in Paris. He was now making his way to Erevan, in Russia, on a sightseeing tour from Trebizond. His companion was a Greek from Salonika, who had lived for several years in London, whence he had departed not many weeks before for Tehran, Persia. These two travelers had met in Constantinople, and the young Greek, who could speak English, Greek, and Turkish, had been acting as interpreter for the artist. 
they had heard of the devil's carts when in Vaughan, and had made straight for our quarters on their arrival in Bayezid. At this point they were separate. When we learned that the old gentleman, Ignaz Raffel by name, was a member of an alpine club and an experienced mountain climber, we urged him to join in the ascent. Though his shoulders were bent by the cares and troubles of sixty-three years, we finally induced him to accompany our party. Kansa, the Greek, reluctantly agreed to do likewise, and proved to be an excellent interpreter, but a poor climber. The following morning we paid the Mutasarif a second visit, with Kansta as interpreter. Inasmuch as the Kurdish chief had not arrived, the Mutasarif said he would make us bearers of a letter to him. Two Zaptias were to accompany us in the morning, while others were to go ahead and announce our approach. At ten minutes of eleven on the morning of the 2nd of July, our small cavalcade with the two exasperating donkeys at the head laden with mats, bags of provisions, extra clothing, alpenstocks, spiked shoes, and coils of stout rope, filed down the streets of Bayezid, followed by a curious rabble. As Bayezid lies hidden behind a projecting spur of the mountains, we could obtain no view of the peak itself until we had tramped some distance out on the plain. Its huge giant mass broke upon us all at once. We stopped and looked and looked again. No mountain peak we have seen, though several have been higher, has ever inspired the feeling which filled us when we looked for the first time upon towering Ararat. We had not proceeded far before we descried a party of Kurdish horsemen approaching from the mountain. Our Zaptias advanced rather cautiously to meet them, with rifles thrown across the pommels of their saddles. After a rather mysterious parley, our Zaptias signaled that all was well. On coming up, they reported that these horsemen belonged to the party that was friendly to the Turkish government. The Kurds, they said, were at this time divided among themselves, a portion of them having adopted conciliatory measures with the government, and the rest holding aloof. But we rather considered their little performance as a scheme to extort a little more bakshish for their necessary presence. The plain we were now on was drained by a tributary of the Aras River. A small stream reached after two hours' steady tramping. From the bordering hillocks we emerged in a short time upon another vast plateau, which stretched far away in a gentle rise to the base of the mountain itself. Nearby we discovered a lone willow tree, the only one in the whole sweep of our vision, under the gracious foliage of which sat a band of Kurds, retired from the heat of the afternoon sun, their horses feeding on some swamp grass near at hand. Attracted by this sign of water, we drew near, and found a copious spring. A few words from the Zaptias, who had advanced among them, seemed to put the Kurds at their ease, though they did not by any means appease their curiosity. They invited us to partake of their frugal lunch of ekmek and goat's milk cheese. Our clothes and baggage were discussed piece by piece, with loud expressions of merriment, until one of us arose and, stealing behind the group, snapped the camera. What was that? said a burly member of the group, as he looked round with scowling face at his companions. Yes, what was that? they echoed and then made a rush for the manipulator of the black box, which they evidently took for some instrument of the black art. The photographer stood serenely innocent, and winked at the Zaptia to give the proper explanation. He was equal to the occasion. That, said he, is an instrument for taking time by the sun. At this the box went the round, each one gazing intently into the lens, then scratching his head, and casting a bewildered look at his nearest neighbor. We noticed that everyone but us was armed with knife, revolver, and martini rifle a belt of cartridges surrounding his waist. It occurred to us that Turkey was adopting a rather poor method of clipping the wings of these mountain birds by selling them the very best equipments for war. Legally, none but government guards are permitted to carry arms, and yet both guns and ammunition are sold in the bazaars of almost every city of the Turkish dominions. The existence of these people in their wild, semi-independent state shows not so much the power of the Kurds as the weakness of the Turkish government, which desires to use a people of so fierce a reputation for the suppression of its other subjects. After half an hour's rest, we prepared to decamp, and so did our Kurdish companions. They were soon in their saddles and galloping away in front of us, with their arms clanking and glittering in the afternoon sunlight. At the spring we had turned off the trail that led over the Sardarbulak Pass into Russia, and were now following a horse path which winds up to the Kurdish encampments on the southern slope of the mountain. The plain was strewn with sand and rocks, with here and there a bunch of tough, wiry grass about a foot and a half high, which, though early in the year, was partly dry. It would have been hot work except for the rain of the day before and a strong southeast wind. As it was, our feet were blistered and bruised, the thin leather sandals worn at the outset offering very poor protection. The atmosphere being dry, though not excessively hot, we soon began to suffer from thirst. 
although we searched diligently for water we did not find it till after two hours more of constant marching when at a height of about six thousand feet fifty yards from the path we discerned a picturesque cascade of sparkling cold mountain water even the old gentleman raffle joined heartily in the gaiety induced by this clear cold water from ararat's melting snows our ascent for two and a half hours longer was through a luxurious vegetation of flowers grasses and weeds which grew more and more scanty as we advanced prominent among the specimens were the wild pink poppy and rose one small fragrant herb that was the most abundant of all we were told was used by the kurds for making tea all these filled the evening air with perfume as we trudged along passing now and then a kurdish lad with his flock of sheep and goats feeding on the mountain grass which was here much more luxuriant than before looking backward we saw that we were higher than the precipitous cliffs which overtower the town of bayazid and which are perhaps from fifteen hundred to two thousand feet above the lowest part of the plain the view over the plateau was now grand though we were all fatigued by the day's work the cool moisture-laden air of evening revived our flagging spirits we forged ahead with nimble step joking and singing a variety of national airs the french marseillais in which the old gentleman heartily joined echoed and re-echoed among the rocks and caused the shepherd lads and their flocks to crane their heads in wonderment even the armenian muleteer so far overcame his fear of the kurdish robbers as to indulge in one of his accustomed funeral dirges but it stopped short never to go again when we came in sight of the kurdish encampment the poor fellow instinctively grabbed his donkeys about their necks as though they were about to plunge over a precipice the zaptias dashed ahead with the mutasarif's letter to the kurdish chief we followed slowly on foot while the armenian and his two pets kept at a respectful distance in the rear the disk of the sun had already touched the western horizon when we came to the black tents of the kurdish encampment which at this time of the day presented a rather busy scene the women seemed to be doing all the work while their lords sat round on their haunches some of the women were engaged in milking the sheep and goats in an enclosure others were busy making butter in a churn which was nothing more than a skin vessel three feet long of the shape of a brazil nut suspended from a rude tripod this they swung to and fro to the tune of a weird kurdish song behind one of the tents on a primitive weaving machine some of them were making tent roofing and matting Others still were walking about with a ball of wool in one hand and a distaff in the other, spinning yarn. The flocks stood round about, bleeding and lowing, or chewing their cud in quiet contentment. All seemed very domestic and peaceful, except for the Kurdish dogs, which set upon us with loud, fierce growlings and gnashing teeth. Not so was it with the Kurdish chief, who by this time had finished reading the Mutasarif's message, and who now advanced from his tent with salams of welcome. As he stood before us in the glowing sunset, he was a rather tall but well-proportioned man with black eyes and dark moustache contrasting well with his brown-tanned complexion upon his face was the stamp of a rather wild and retiring character although treachery and deceit were by no means wanting he wore a headgear that was something between a hat and a turban and over his baggy turkish trousers hung a long persian coat of bright-coloured large-figured cloth bound at the waist by a belt of cartridges across the shoulder was slung a breech-loading martini rifle and from his neck dangled a heavy gold chain which was probably the spoil of some predatory expedition a quiet dignity sat on ishmael deverish's stalwart form it was with no little pleasure that we accepted his invitation to a cup of tea after our walk of nineteen miles in which we had ascended from three thousand to seven thousand feet we were in fit condition to appreciate a rest that kurdish tent as far as we were concerned was a veritable palace although we were almost blinded by the smoke from the green pine branches on the smouldering fire we said that the chief invited us to a cup of tea so he did but we provided the tea and that too not only for our own party but for half a dozen of the chief's personal friends there being only two glasses in the camp we of course had to wait until our kurdish acquaintances had quenched their burning thirst in thoughtful mood we gazed around through the evening twilight far away on the western slope we could see some kurdish women plodding along under heavy burdens of pine branches like those that were now fumigating our eyes and nostrils across the hills the kurdish shepherds were driving home their herds and flocks to the tinkling of bells all this to us was deeply impressive such peaceful scenes we thought could never be the haunt of warlike robbers the flocks at last came home the shouts of the shepherds ceased darkness fell and all was quiet one by one the lights in the tents broke out like the stars above 
as the darkness deepened they shone more and more brightly across the amphitheater of the encampment the tent in which we were now sitting was oblong in shape covered with a mixture of goats and sheep's wool carded spun and woven by the kurdish women this tenting was all of a dark brown or black color the various strips were badly joined together allowing the snow and rain during the stormy night that followed to penetrate plentifully a wicker-work fencing about three feet high made from the reeds gathered in the swamps of the aras river was stretched around the bottom of the tent to keep out the cattle as well as to afford some little protection from the elements this same material of the same width or height was used to partition off the apartments of the women far from being veiled and shut up in harems like their turkish and persian sisters the kurdish women come and go among the men and talk and laugh as they please the thinness and lowness of the partition walls did not disturb their astonishing equanimity in their relations with the men the women are extremely free during the evening we frequently found ourselves surrounded by a concourse of these mountain beauties who would sit and stare at us with their black eyes call attention to our personal oddities and laugh among themselves now and then their jokes at our expense would produce hilarious laughter among the men the dress of these women consisted of baggy trousers better described in this country as divided skirts a bright-colored overskirt and tunic and a little round cloth cap encircled with a band of red and black through the right lobe of the nose was hung a peculiar button-shaped ornament studded with precious stones the picturesque costume well set off their rich olive complexions and black eyes beneath dark brown lashes end of section three section four of across asia on a bicycle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jim price at voiceoverthefence.com across asia on a bicycle by thomas allen chapter two there were no signs of an approaching evening meal until we opened our provision bag and handed over certain articles of raw food to be cooked for us no sooner were the viands instructed to the care of our hosts than two sets of pots and kettles made their appearance in the other compartments in half an hour our host and friends proceeded to indulge their voracious appetites when our own meal was brought to us some time after we noticed that the fourteen eggs we had doled out had been reduced to six and the other materials suffered a similar reduction the whole thing being so patent as to make their attempt at innocence absurdly ludicrous we thought however if Kurdish highway robbery took no worse form than this, we could well afford to be content. Supper over, we squatted round a slow-burning fire, on the thick felt mats which served as carpets, drank tea, and smoked the usual cigarettes. By the light of the glowing embers we could watch the faces about us, and catch their horrified glances when reference was made to our intended ascent of Akdak, the mysterious abode of the jinn. Before turning in for the night, we reconnoitred our situation the lights in all the tents save our own were now extinguished not a sound was heard except the heavy breathing of some of the slumbering animals about us or the bark of a dog at some distant encampment the huge dome of ararat though six to eight miles farther up the slope seemed to be towering over us like some giant monster of another world we could not see the summit so far was it above the enveloping clouds we returned to the tent to find that the zaptias had been given the best places and best covers to sleep in and that we were expected to accommodate ourselves near the door wrapped up in an old kurdish carpet policy was evidently a better developed trait of kurdish character than hospitality although we arose at four seven o'clock saw us still at the encampment two hours vanished before our gentlemen zaptias condescended to rise from their peaceful slumbers then a great deal of time was unnecessarily consumed in eating their special breakfast we ourselves had to be content with ekmek and yaurt blotting paper bread and curdled milk this over they concluded not to go on without sandals to take the place of their heavy military boots as at this point their horses would have to be discarded after we had employed a kurd to make these for them they declared they were afraid to proceed without the company of ten kurds armed to the teeth we knew that this was only a scheme on the part of the Kurds, with whom the Zaptias were in league, to extort money from us. We still kept cool, and only casually insinuated that we did not have enough money to pay for so large a party. This announcement worked like a charm. The interest the Kurds had up to this time taken in our venture died away at once. Even the three Kurds who, as requested in the message of the Mutasarif, were to accompany us up the mountain to the snow line, 
refused absolutely to go. The mention of the Mutasarif's name awakened only a sneer. We had also relied upon the Kurds for blankets, as we had been advised to do by our friends in Bayazid. Those we had already hired they now snatched from the donkeys standing before the tent. All this time our tall, gaunt, meek-looking muleteer had stood silent. Now his turn had come. How far was he to go with his donkeys? He didn't think it possible for him to go much beyond this point. Patience now ceased to be a virtue. We cut off discussion at once, told the muleteer he would either go on or lose what he had already earned, and informed the Zaptias that whatever they did would be reported to the Mutasarif on our return. Under this rather forcible persuasion, they stood not on the order of their going, but sullenly followed our little procession out of camp before the crestfallen Kurds. In the absence of guides, we were thrown upon our own resources. Far from being an assistance, our Zaptias proved a nuisance. They would carry nothing, not even the food they were to eat, and were absolutely ignorant of the country we were to traverse. From our observations on the previous days, we had decided to strike out on a northeast course over the gentle slope until we struck the rocky ridges on the southeast buttress of the dome. On its projecting rocks, which extended nearer to the summit than those of any other part of the mountain, we could avoid the slippery, precipitous snow beds that stretched far down the mountain at this time of the year. Immediately after leaving the encampment, the ascent became steeper and more difficult. The small volcanic stones of yesterday now increased to huge obstructing boulders, among which the donkeys with difficulty made their way. They frequently tipped their loads or got wedged in between two unyielding walls. In the midst of our efforts to extricate them, we often wondered how Noah ever managed with the animals from the ark. Had these donkeys not been of a philosophical turn of mind, they might have offered forcible objections to the way we extricated them from their straitened circumstances. A remonstrance on our part for carelessness in driving brought from the muleteer a burst of Turkish profanity that made the rocks of Ararat resound with indignant echoes. The spirit of insubordination seemed to be increasing in direct ratio with the height of our ascent. We came now to a comparatively smooth green slope which led up to the highest Kurdish encampment met on the line of our ascent, about 7,500 feet, when in sight of the black tents the subject of Kurdish guides was again broached by the Zaptias, and immediately they sat down to discuss the question. We ourselves were through with discussion, and fully determined to have nothing to do with the people who could do absolutely nothing for us. We stopped at the tents and asked for milk. Yes, they said, we have some. But after waiting for ten minutes, we learned that the milk was still in the goat's possession, several hundred yards away from the rocks. It dawned upon us that this was only another trick of the Zaptias to get a rest. We pushed on the next five hundred feet of the ascent without much trouble or controversy, the silence broken only by the muleteer, who took the rocky bottle off the donkey's pack and asked if he could take a drink. As we had only a limited supply to be used to dilute the snow water, we were obliged to refuse him. At 8,000 feet we struck our first snowdrift, into which the donkeys sank up to their bodies. It required our united efforts to lift them out and half carry them across. Then on we climbed till 10 o'clock, to a point about 9,000 feet, where we stopped for lunch in a quiet mountain glen by the side of a rippling mountain rill. This snow water we drank with Rocky. The view in the meantime had been growing more and more extensive. The plain before us had lost nearly all its detail and color and was merged into one vast whole. Though less picturesque, it was incomparably grander. Now we could see how, in ages past, the lava had burst out of the lateral fissures in the mountain, and flowed in huge streams for miles down the slope and out on the plain below. These beds of lava were gradually broken up by the action of the elements, and now presented the appearance of ridges of broken volcanic rocks of the most varied and fantastic shapes. It was here that the muleteer showed evident signs of weakening, which later on developed into a total collapse. We had come to a broad snow field where the donkeys stuck fast and rolled over helpless in the snow. Even after we had unstrapped their baggage and carried it over on our shoulders, they could make no headway. The muleteer gave up in despair and refused even to help us carry our loads to the top of an adjoining hill, whither the Zaptias had proceeded to wait for us. In consequence, Ruffle and we were compelled to carry two donkey loads of baggage for half a mile over the snow beds and boulders followed by the sulking muleteer, who had deserted his donkeys rather than be left alone himself. On reaching the Zaptias, we sat down to hold a council on the situation. But the clouds, which during the day had occasionally obscured the top of the mountain, now began to thicken, 
and it was not long before a shower compelled us to beat a hasty retreat to a neighboring ledge of rocks the clouds that were rolling between us and the mountain summit seemed but a token of the storm of circumstances one thing was certain the muleteer could go no farther up the mountain and yet he was mortally afraid to return alone to the kurdish robbers he sat down and began to cry like a child this predicament of their accomplice furnished the zaptias with a plausible excuse they now absolutely refused to go any farther without him our interpreter the greek again joined the majority he was not going to risk the ascent without the turkish guards and besides he had now come to the conclusion that we had not sufficient blankets to spend a night at so high an altitude disappointed but not discouraged we gazed at the silent old gentleman at our side in his determined countenance we read his answer long shall we remember ignaz serafel as one of the pluckiest most persevering of old men there was now only one plan that could be pursued selecting from our supplies one small blanket a felt mat two long stout ropes enough food to last us two days a bottle of cold tea and a can of turkish rocky we packed them into two bundles to strap on our backs we then instructed the rest of the party to return to the kurdish encampment and await our return the sky was again clear at two thirty p m when we bade good-bye to our worthless comrades and resumed the ascent we were now at a height of nine thousand feet and it was our plan to camp at a point far enough up the mountain to enable us to complete the ascent on the following day and return to the kurdish encampment by nightfall beyond us was a region of snow and barren rocks among which we still saw a small purple flower and bunches of lichens which grew more rare as we advanced our course continued in a northeast direction toward the main southeast ridge of the mountain sometimes we were floundering with our heavy loads in the deep snow beds or scrambling on hands and knees over the huge boulders of the rocky seams two hours and a half of climbing brought us to the crest of the main southeast ridge about one thousand feet below the base of the precipitous dome at this point our course changed from northeast to northwest and continued so during the rest of the ascent little ararat was now in full view we could even distinguish upon its northwest side a deep-cut gorge which was not visible before upon its smooth and perfect slopes remained only the tatters of its last winter's garments we could also look far out over the sardar bulak ridge which connects the two ararats and on which the cossacks are encamped it was to them that the mutasarif had desired us to go but we had subsequently determined to make the ascent directly from the turkish side following up this southeast ridge we came at five forty five p m to a point about eleven thousand feet here the thermometer registered thirty nine degrees fahrenheit and was constantly falling if we should continue on the cold during the night especially with our scanty clothing would become intolerable and then too we could scarcely find a spot level enough to sleep on we therefore determined to stop here for the night and to continue the ascent at dawn some high rugged crags on the ridge above us attracted our attention as affording a comparatively protected lodging among these we spread our carpet and piled stones in the intervening spaces to form a complete enclosure thus busily engaged we failed for a time to realize the grandeur of the situation over the vast and misty panorama that spread out before us the lingering rays of the setting sun shed a tinge of gold which was communicated to the snowy beds around us behind the peak of little ararat a brilliant rainbow stretched in one grand archway above the weeping clouds but this was only one turn of nature's kaleidoscope the arch soon faded away and the shadows lengthened and deepened across the plain and mingled till all was lost to view behind the falling curtains of the night the kurdish tents far down the slope and the white curling smoke from their evening campfires we could see no more only the occasional bark of a dog was borne upward through the impenetrable darkness colder and colder grew the atmosphere from thirty nine degrees the thermometer gradually fell to thirty six degrees to thirty three degrees and during the night dropped below freezing point the snow which fell from the clouds just over our heads covered our frugal supper table on which were placed a few hard-boiled eggs some tough turkish bread cheese and a bottle of tea mixed with rocky iced tea was no doubt a luxury at this time of the year but not on mount ararat at the height of eleven thousand feet with the temperature at freezing point ruffle was as cheerful as could be expected under the circumstances he expressed his delight at our progress thus far and now that we were free from our gentlemen attendants he considered our chances for success much brighter we turned in together under our single blanket with the old gentleman between us he had put on every article of clothing including gloves hat hood cloak and heavy shoes for pillows we used the provision bags and camera 
the bottle of cold tea we buttoned up in our coats to prevent it from freezing. On both sides and above us lay the pure white snow, below us a huge abyss, into which the rocky ridge descended like a darkened stairway to the lower regions. The awful stillness was unbroken, save by the whistling of the wind among the rocks. Dark masses of clouds seemed to bear down upon us every now and then, opening up their trap doors and letting down a heavy fall of snow. The heat of our bodies melted the ice beneath us, and our clothes became saturated with ice water. Although we were surrounded by snow and ice, we were suffering with a burning thirst. Since separating from our companions, we had found no water whatever, while the single bottle of cold tea we had must be preserved for the morrow. Asleep under such circumstances, and in our cramped position, was utterly impossible. At one o'clock the morning star peeped above the eastern horizon. This we watched hour after hour as it rose in unrivaled beauty toward the zenith until at last it began to fade away in the first gray streaks of the morning. By the light of a flickering candle we ate a hurried breakfast, fastened on our spiked shoes, and strapped to our backs a few indispensable articles, leaving the rest of our baggage at the camp until our return. Just at daybreak, 3.55 a.m., on the 4th of July, we started off on what proved to be the hardest day's work we had ever accomplished. We struck out at once across the broad snow field to the second rock rib on the right, which seemed to lead up to the only line of rocks above. The surface of these large snowbeds had frozen during the night, so that we had to cut steps with our ice picks to keep from slipping down their glassy surface. Up this ridge we slowly climbed for three weary hours, leaping from boulder to boulder, or dragging ourselves up their precipitous sides. The old gentleman halted frequently to rest, and showed evident signs of weariness. It is hard, we must take it slowly, he would say, in German, whenever our impatience would get the better of our prudence. At seven o'clock we reached a point about 13,500 feet, beyond which there seemed to be nothing but the snow-covered slope, with only a few projecting rocks along the edge of a tremendous gorge which now broke upon our astonished gaze. Toward this we directed our course, and, an hour later, stood upon its very verge. Our venerable companion now looked up at the precipitous slope above us, where only some stray projecting rocks were left to guide us through the wilderness of snow. Boys, said he despondently, I cannot reach the top. I have not rested during the night, and I am now falling asleep on my feet. Besides, I am very much fatigued. This came almost like a sob from a breaking heart. Although the old gentleman was opposed to the ascent in the first instance, his old alpine spirit arose within him with all its former vigor when once he had started up the mountain slope, and now, when almost in sight of the very goal, his strength began to fail him. After much persuasion and encouragement, he finally said that if he could get half an hour's rest and sleep, he thought he would be able to continue. We then wrapped him up in his great coat and dug out a comfortable bed in the snow, while one of us sat down with back against him to keep him from rolling down the mountainside. We were now on the chasm's brink, looking down into its unfathomable depths. This gigantic rent, hundreds of feet in width and thousands in depth, indicates that northwest-southeast line along which the volcanic forces of Ararat have acted most powerfully. This fissure is perhaps the greatest with which the mountain is seamed, and out of which has undoubtedly been discharged a great portion of its lava. Starting from the base of the dome, it seemed to pierce the shifting clouds to a point about 500 feet from the summit. This line is continued out into the plain in a series of small volcanoes, the craters of which appear to be as perfect as though they had been in activity only yesterday. The solid red and yellow rocks which lined the sides of the great chasm projected above the opposite brink in jagged and appalling cliffs. The whole was encased in a mass of huge, fantastic icicles, which, glittering in the sunlight, gave it the appearance of a natural crystal palace. No more fitting place than this could the fancy of the Kurds depict for the home of the terrible jinn. No better symbol of nature for the awful jaws of death. Our companion now awoke considerably refreshed, and the ascent was continued close to the chasm's brink. Here were the only rocks to be seen in the vast snowbed around us. Cautiously we proceeded, with cat-like tread, following directly in one another's footsteps, and holding on to our alpenstocks like grim death. A loosened rock would start at first slowly, gain momentum, and fairly fly. Striking against some projecting ledge, it would bound a hundred feet or more into the air, and then drop out of sight among the clouds below. Every few moments we would stop to rest. Our knees were like lead, and the high altitude made breathing difficult. Now the trail of rocks led us within two feet of the chasm's edge. We approached it cautiously, probing well for a rock foundation, and gazing with dizzy heads into the abyss. 
The slope became steeper and steeper, until it abutted in an almost precipitous cliff coated with snow and glistening ice. There was no escape from it, for all around the snow beds were too steep and slippery to venture an ascent upon them. Cutting steps with our ice picks, and half crawling, half dragging ourselves with the alpenstocks hooked into the rocks above, we scaled its height and advanced to the next abutment. Now a cloud, as warm as exhausted steam, enveloped us in the midst of this ice and snow. When it cleared away, the sun was reflected with intenser brightness. Our faces were already smarting with blisters, and our dark glasses afforded but little protection to our aching eyes. At eleven a.m. we sat down on the snow to eat our last morsel of food. The cold chicken and bread tasted like sawdust, for we had no saliva with which to masticate them. Our single bottle of tea had given out, and we suffered with thirst for several hours. Again the word to start was given. We rose at once, but our stiffened legs quivered beneath us, and we leaned on our alpenstocks for support. Still we plodded on for two more weary hours, cutting our steps in the icy cliffs, or sinking to our thighs in the treacherous snowbeds. We could see that we were nearing the top of the great chasm, for the clouds, now entirely cleared away, left our view unobstructed. We could even descry the black Kurdish tents upon the northeast slope, and far below, the Aras River, like a streak of silver threading its way into the purple distance. The atmosphere about us grew colder, and we buttoned up our now too scanty garments. We must be nearing the top, we thought, and yet we were not certain, for a huge precipitous cliff just in front of us cut off the view. Slowly, slowly, feebly shouted the old gentleman, as we began the attack on its precipitous sides, now stopping to brush away the treacherous snow, or to cut some steps in the solid ice. We pushed and pulled one another almost to the top, and then, with one more desperate effort, we stood upon a vast and gradually sloping snowbed. Down we plunged above our knees through the yielding surface, and staggered and fell with failing strength, then rose once more and plodded on, until at last we sank exhausted upon the top of Ararat. For a moment only we lay gasping for breath. Then a full realization of our situation dawned upon us, and fanned the few faint sparks of enthusiasm that remained in our exhausted bodies. We unfurled upon an alpenstock the small silk American flag that we had brought from home and for the first time the stars and stripes was given to the breeze on the mountain of the ark. Four shots fired from our revolvers in commemoration of Independence Day broke the stillness of the gorges, far above the clouds, which were rolling below us over three of the most absolute monarchies in the world, was celebrated in our simple way a great event of republicanism. Mount Ararat, it will be observed from the accompanying sketch, has two tops, a few hundred yards apart, sloping on the eastern and western extremities into rather prominent abutments and separated by a snow valley or depression from fifty to one hundred feet in depth the eastern top on which we were standing was quite extensive and thirty to forty feet lower than its western neighbor both tops are hummocks on the huge dome of ararat like the humps on the back of a camel on neither one of which is there a vestige of anything but snow there remained just as little trace of the crosses left by parrot and chodsko as of the ark itself we remembered the pictures we had seen in our nursery books, which represented this mountain top covered with green grass, and Noah stepping out of the ark in the bright, warm sunshine before the receding waves, and now we looked around and saw this very spot covered with perpetual snow. Nor did we see any evidence whatever of a former existing crater, except perhaps the snow-filled depression we have just mentioned. There was nothing about this perpetual snowfield and the freezing atmosphere that was chilling us to the bone to remind us that we were on the top of an extinct volcano that once trembled with the convulsions of subterranean heat. The view from this towering height was immeasurably extensive and almost too grand. All detail was lost, all color, all outline. Even the surrounding mountains seemed to be but excrescent ridges of the plain. Then, too, we could catch only occasional glimpses as the clouds shifted to and fro. At one time they opened up beneath us and revealed the Aras Valley with its glittering ribbon of silver at an abysmal depth below. Now and then we could descry the black volcanic peaks of Aligetz, forty miles away to the northwest, and on the southwest the low mountains that obscured the town of Bayazid. Of the Caucasus, the mountains about Erzurum on the west and Lake Vaughan on the south, and even of the Caspian Sea, all of which are said to be in Ararat's horizon, we could see absolutely nothing. Had it been a clear day, we could have seen not only the rival peaks of the Caucasus, which for so many years formed the northern wall of the civilized world, but far to the south, we might have described the mountains of Quarduland, where Chaldean legend has placed the landing of the Ark. 
we might have gazed in philosophic mood over the whole of the Eris Valley, which for three thousand years or more has been the scene of so much misery and conflict. As monuments of two extreme events in this historic period, two spots might have attracted our attention. One right below us, the ruins of Ardashatta, which, according to tradition, was built, as the story goes, after the plans of the roving conqueror Hannibal, and stormed by the Roman legions, A.D. 58, and farther away to the north, the modern fortress of Kars, which so recently reverberated with the thunders of the Turkish war. We were suddenly aroused by the rumbling of thunder below us. A storm was rolling rapidly up the southeast slope of the mountain. The atmosphere seemed to be boiling over the heated plain below. Higher and higher came the clouds, rolling and seething among the grim crags along the chasm, and soon we were caught in its embrace. The thermometer dropped at once below freezing point, and the dense mists, driven against us by the hurricane, formed icicles on our blistered faces, and froze the ink in our fountain pens. Our summer clothing was wholly inadequate for such an unexpected experience. We were chilled to the bone. To have remained where we were would have been jeopardizing our health, if not our lives. Although we could scarcely see far enough ahead to follow back on the track by which we had ascended, yet we were obliged to attempt it at once, for the storm around us was increasing every moment. We could even feel the charges of electricity whenever we touched the iron points of our alpenstocks. Carefully peering through the clouds, we managed to follow the trail we had made along the gradually sloping summit, to the head of the great chasm, which now appeared more terrible than ever. We here saw that it would be extremely perilous, if not actually impossible, to attempt a descent on the rocks along its treacherous edge in such a hurricane. The only alternative was to take the precipitous snow-covered slope. Planting our ice hooks deep in the snow behind us, we started. At first the strong headwind, which on the top almost took us off our feet, somewhat checked our downward career, but it was not long before we attained a velocity that made our hair stand on end. It was a thrilling experience. We seemed to be sailing through the air itself, for the clouds obscured the slope even twenty feet below. Finally we emerged beneath them into the glare of the afternoon sunlight, but on we dashed for six thousand feet, leaning heavily on the trailing stalks, which threw up an icy spray in our wake. We never once stopped until we reached the bottom of the dome at our last night's camp among the rocks. In less than an hour we had dashed down, through a distance which had taken us nine and a half hours to ascend. The camp was reached at four p.m., just twelve hours from the time we left it. Gathering up the remaining baggage, we hurried away to continue the descent. We must make desperate efforts to reach the Kurdish encampment by nightfall, for during the last twenty-seven hours we had had nothing to drink but half a pint of tea, and our thirst by this time became almost intolerable. The large snow bed down which we had been sliding now began to show signs of treachery. The snow, at this low altitude, had melted out from below to supply the subterranean streams, leaving only a thin crust at the surface. It was not long before one of our party fell into one of these pitfalls up to his shoulders and floundered about for some time before he could extricate himself from his unexpected snow bath. Over the rocks and boulders the descent was much slower and more tedious. For two hours we were thus busily engaged, when all at once a shot rang out in the clear evening air. Looking up we saw, sure enough, our two Zaptias and muleteer on the very spot where we had left them the evening before. Even the two donkeys were on hand to give us a welcoming bray. They had come up from the encampment early in the morning and had been scanning the mountain all day long to get some clue to our whereabouts. They reported that they had seen us at one time during the morning and had then lost sight of us among the clouds. This solicitude on their part was no doubt prompted by the fact that they were to be held by the Mutasarif of Bayazid as personally responsible for our safe return, and perhaps, too, by the hope that they might thus retrieve the good graces they had lost the day before, and thereby increase the amount of their forthcoming bakshish. Nothing now was too heavy for the donkeys, and even the zaptias themselves condescended to relieve us of our alpenstocks. That night we sat again around the Kurdish campfire, surrounded by the same group of curious faces. It was interesting and even amusing to watch the bewildered astonishment that overspread their countenance as we related our experiences along the slope and then upon the very top of Akdag. They listened throughout with profound attention, then looked at one another in silence and gravely shook their heads. They could not believe it. It was impossible. Old Ararat stood above us grim and terrible beneath the twinkling stars. To them it was, as it always will be, the same mysterious untrodden height, the palace of the jinn. End of section 4